It's my pleasure to introduce Maria Chernovsky from Princeton University to teach us about 3D composition. Thank you, Ming Shen. Uh, should we close this up? Yeah. Need to accept the uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, uh, so this is not my first time here. In fact, I just found out I gave the first talk of the seminar. Uh, <laughs> very good. Very good. So now I'm giving this balance just again the first talk of this in the spring, which is in person after pandemic. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I uh, I'm gonna do try to tell you about what I've been doing for the last few years. So none of it is very big details, but uh, uh, I'll try to, to give an impression of uh, what I have been trying to achieve and what I'm still trying to achieve. What we did achieve. And different different uh, theorems here are joined with uh, different people. So I'll say who the authors are, and if I don't say it, it will always be written down. And then uh, lastly, please ask questions. I know some of you, but I don't know all of you, so I, can, I don't really know who I'm talking to. So if I'm if I'm if I say things that you don't understand, please stop me. Nothing here that cannot be understood. It's just that it's and it needs to be defined. Okay. Um, so I'm a graph theorist. I work on graphs. Uh, and in my uh, notation, graphs have vertices and edges. Vertices are always v, edges are always e, and n is always a number of vertices. And uh, what I've been working on for most of my career is trying to understand the structure of graphs that you that you describe by forbidding what's called an induced subgraph by forbidding it and forbidding uh, so you say I'm interested in a class of graphs where if I delete vertices I don't get a certain configuration fix a configuration and say that's what I don't get by vertex deletion and that's called induced subgraphs and you know, apparently it turns out there's a lot you can say about that. Uh, so I'll tell you some things that you can say about it, but let me first uh, make this more precise. Uh, so H is an induced subgraph of G. If you can uh, get H from G by deleting vertices, you're not allowed. Uh, so the most uh, well-known translation on graphs is uh, that of the subgraph. That's when you say the vertex set is a subset of the vertex set, the H set is a subset of the H set. But this is different. Here, you don't have flexibility on edges. You can decide which vertices you take, but then you're not allowed to uh, arbitrarily delete edges. Uh, so here's an example. This is G. This is an induced subgraph of G, because to get this from that, you delete that middle vertex. You delete all the edges incident with it, uh, and you don't delete anything else. This is not an induced subgraph of G, because to get this from that, what you would need to do is delete this edge and delete that edge, and you're not allowed to do that. That's not an allowed operation. Uh, so I'll write H is uh, contained in G, like this, and the family of graphs is called hereditary if it's closed under taking two uh, I have to say, I made this slide in uh, 2002 when I gave my first talk. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the funny thing is that when you give a talk and they take pictures, they usually don't take a picture there, they take a picture, a picture at the start and then the photographer goes away. So three quarters of my uh, uh, top pictures is me on this slide. Somebody keeping track of uh, history. You had iPad since then. <laughs> you got it. I had it on a, a plastic side, but actually I got a tablet a long time ago before okay. before I had so uh, by 2005 it was like, um, so. yeah, it's thinking. Yeah. <laughs> People will find out that I'm lying. Uh, okay, so there was some um, uh, suspicion in the community about thinking about induced subgraphs because uh, people sometimes think it's somehow too local a relation. You you know to contain some things in induced subgraphs, for the interested in um, forbidding it five products in induced subgraphs. So I just need to check five tuples of, of my big graph and see if they satisfy the the, the product, if they look like the thing I'm forbidding or not. And then, uh, there was some suspicion that maybe it doesn't tell you enough about. The big structure. Uh, but uh, in the last, uh, say, 20, 30 years, I think uh, the community has come to believe that, uh, that it's not true, that uh, you do learn a lot about the graph by forbidding its induced subgraphs, uh, by forbidding some induced subgraphs. And I'm going to I'm going to spend the first uh, part of my talk and trying to give examples of that and trying to explain that. 
Uh, so one of the most well-known uh, hereditary families is uh, the family of perfect graphs. And the graph is perfect if uh, the click number and the chromatic number are the same. So let me remind you what that is. The chromatic number is if you want to partition the, ver the vertex set into subsets so that in each subset there's no edge. It's called a stable set. Uh, right, so when you partition the vertex set into conflict free sets. And then the click number is the biggest, biggest size of the uh, uh, biggest size of the set of pairwise adjacent vertices. So then, of course, the chromatic number is at least the click number because if I have 100 vertices all pairwise adjacent, I need to give each of them a different color. Uh, and sometimes it's the same. Very rarely it's the same. The click, the click number and the chromatic number are the same. And if graph is perfect, I'm going to ask even more. And I'm going to ask that the, the, the click number and the chromatic number are the same for the graph, but also for all its induced suburbs. And somehow that gives a much more interesting family of graphs than if you just ask for quality uh, for quality for the graph. So let me not explain that. Uh, but uh, so this uh, family of perfect graphs, this uh, idea of perfect graph, was first introduced by uh, the French mathematician Claude Berge in 1961. And uh, he so he noticed that these graphs had a lot of uh, kind of unexpected properties. Uh, they uh, so that was the definition, and then you notice that that, uh, that gives you a different way to say many theorems that were known in graph theory at the time. Um, and then he made two conjectures about them. Uh, one was that uh, if you take complements to the properties preserved, so you take complements means to replace every edge by a non edge and to replace every non edge by an edge. And Bear's conjecture that the graph is perfect if and only if its complement is perfect. Which is a very surprising thing to conjecture. Right? If you just look at the definition, don't read, uh, don't read ahead. Uh, right? So the definition says something about the click number and the chromatic number, and that has kind of nothing to do with the complement. So he really believed this was a very deep property if he if he thought um, something so fundamental is true, something so kind of deep in the core of a graph is true. So then uh, he also made a stronger conjecture, which explains why. Uh, why uh, he thought the first conjecture could be true. And that is what's called the strong perfect graph conjecture, which is now the strong perfect graph theorem. And what that says that uh, actually you can describe all minimal and perfect separates, minimal in terms of induced separates. So you can des describe all the abstractions to being perfect. He conjectured and we proved this as group of authors the graph is perfect if and, not, if and only if it does not contain as an induced subgraph a node cycle and it does not contain as an induced subgraph the complement of the nodes. Of length at least five. Uh, so, if you think about it for a second, one direction of this conjecture is very easy. If the graph is perfect, then all its induced subgraphs need to be perfect. And so, a node cycle, which has chromatic number two and click number three, cannot be an induced subgraph of a perfect one. But the other direction is um, so the direction was open for 40 years until the time was uh, Neil Robinson, Paul Simmer, and Robin Thomas. We solved it. So now, once you believe this, uh, it becomes clear why uh, being perfect is uh, um, invariant undertaking complements, because right, this tells you these are all the abstractions, and the set of abstractions is closed undertaking complement. Set of abstractions, abstractions is closed undertaking complement, and so it's a problem. Uh, okay, so that was, uh, but uh, um, I mean, I should also say that uh, these conjectures that uh, Bersh made generated a lot of research in graph theory. Lots and lots of people whose uh, life's work was to do things related to proving this conjecture. And as you well know, many people work on a topic, the topic develops, and there are other questions that come up, and suddenly, suddenly it's interesting. Okay, um, so another nice thing about perfect graphs, and from what I said so far, what well, should not be able to get it, um, it's the fact that they behave very nicely under, uh, very nicely algorithm. So you said the questions are loud in the ring with Yes, questions are loud too. Scared them at the lunch. So, how hard it is to, to see whether a graph is what's a complex field? And the graph is perfect. And the next. Uh, you can test and time n to the nine. N to the nine? And yeah, I oh, think no. now it's been improved to n to the n, n, n to the nine. Yeah. 
to the eight and a half. Um, okay, even if the graph is a color, doesn't matter if it is a complex means that well. So, asking. so the k color really keys and company for n dealer than it's good, right? Right. So and then the per the definition is uh you know relating chromatic number to this uh click number and so on, right? But even even so, so you ask me what's the complexity of testing for perfection. Yes, yes, yes. That's that's oh, n to n, n to n. Okay. Okay. Uh okay, so it's a theorem of uh, Grotian, Lawless, and Schreiber that you can uh, compute the click number in polynomial time if the input is perfect. And of course, uh, in general, this is an anti complete problem. So, somehow, something interesting is going on in this class of that. There's sufficiently structured, but there's sufficiently something that, uh, uh, that uh, problems that are in general uh, very hard, you can solve in polynomial time. Now, because you can compute the click number and it's perfect, you can compute the dramatic number. In fact, you can also find an optimal coloring. That's that's an easy bit. Uh, you, uh, you run the Grotero's Schreiber algorithm and get Omega. Then I know how to well, people know how to uh, how to uh, get an actual coloring out of it. Uh, because it's close to taking complements, uh, you can find the stability number because the stable biggest set of vertices is no no edges inside. Um, so, so somehow a lot is going on with this uh, class of graphs, and I'm gonna. Uh, so, I want to say something else about this theorem, which is not uh, closely related to anything else I'm going to say, but, but I like to say it. Um, so, the way this, the proof of this theorem works, you describe this as a semi definite program, and then you throw it at a lot of machinery from fundamental optimization, and then you get omega. And that's why what you get is a number and not the color, and then you work hard to get color. On that, you know, there are a lot of theorems about photographs. We almost understand the structure of photographs. We understand it well enough to know that these are the only minimal in photographs. So, but there's not an algorithm to solve this problem just structure, just an algorithm in terms of graphs. If you are I mean, the natural thing would be to take the this indefinite programming um, argument and see if you can reverse engineer it with a graph argument, but uh, apparently not. Most people try to know what they can do. Uh, so it's uh, one of my favorite problems actually is to prove this again, but just uh, but just using that way, just uh, uh, trying to get an algorithm in, uh, that you can say in terms of the graph and understand in terms of the graph. And it's open. It's you know there's, there's been a lot of progress because people are working on it, but uh, but it's uh, little bits here and there that are being nibbled off. You can't really get to the bottom. Of it. So I, I like to advertise this problem in case it's difficult. <laughs> So, all right, so I talked to you about photographs and it's a lovely family, lovely hereditary family with uh, a lot of nice properties. So, one might hope that uh, all hereditary families have nice properties, such as, uh, not such as, but like all minor free families have a lot of nice properties, if you know what that means. Uh, but uh, the answer is not at all. So, here are two uh, especially badly behaved uh, uh, families, uh, hereditary families. Uh, one is uh, so in perfect graphs, the click number, the chromatic number is as close as you can get to the click number, it equals the click number. What if I ask for much, much less? I just want to say the chromatic number is bounded from above as a function of the click number. It is not as bounded from below, but uh, I'm asking when is it bounded from above? So it's not true for the class of all graphs, but one might uh, hope after one encounters perfect graphs that if you forbid an induced subgraph, suddenly that becomes true. But the answer is no, it's not come true. It's even false for triangle. The triangle for graphs with arbitrary large chromatic numbers, so the gap can be can be absurdly large. So the next thing you might hope for is that you can solve problems more easily than in graphs uh, uh, with forbidden induced subgraphs. Uh, for example, maybe you know, stability or omega or, or, or uh, coloring. Uh, so again, finding the click number of graph. It's empty complete even for graphs with no status of CS3. Uh, so it's a really hard problem even if you exclude it. Uh, after I leave my chance and tell you how hard it is to color graphs if you didn't induce some graphs because that's uh, what we worked on for years. Okay, so, but there's one conjecture that does tell you that in some sense, uh, 
hereditary families are nice. If you forbid any induced subgraph, something uh, unexpected happens uh, to your graph. Something global happens to your graph. This is so one of those uh, local global phenomena. If you forbid something local, such as an induced subgraph, something changes in the global behavior of the graph. So let me parse what it says here. It's a conjecture of Radish and Heinel from uh, uh, I think 1977, possibly 1985. It's also a bit If you ask people who know Radish and Heinel, you hear one thing. If you look at papers, you hear another thing. Um, so, but the conjecture is that for every graph H, there is an epsilon. So that if you look at graphs that don't contain H as an induced subgraph, then these graphs suddenly have either a huge click or a huge status. And alpha of G is the same as the largest status. Now, what's huge? Well, huge is the number of vertices to this power of and, and why is that huge? Well, because in the random graph, all you get is low of the number of vertices. So in general, there are graphs where this maximum is low the number of vertices, but if you forbid anything, then suddenly forbid anything is in your subgraph, suddenly it becomes well known than the number of vertices. So this is really um, qualitatively different behavior. Okay, so so uh, uh, so far we saw that uh, some hereditary families are nice, some hereditary families are really not nice, and their kind of conjecture gives you a way in which maybe all hereditary families are nice. Okay, so uh, with all with all this, so what we're gonna uh, ask uh, now is which hereditary family is nice? We and uh, there are many, as, as you saw, there are many. Things you can uh, you can use to define nicenesses, but I'm going to focus on two things. I want to say structure and algorithms. Of course, structure and algor algorithms are closely related. So a question that I will not talk about is this first is this first bullet up here. I will not think about uh, the connection between the chromatic number and the click number, even though there's a lot of work on it. In fact, uh, just this week, I participated in, a, in an online research workshop, which, is, which was exactly about that. Families of graphs with chromatic number uh, bounded by a function of the click number. But um, I've had enough of that, and not on top of it. So we're just going to do structure and algorithms. OK, and uh, one thing that uh, Connects together structure and algorithms. There's the notion of 3D composition. And I'll tell you what it is. Now, if you've never heard of 3D compositions, probably it's not going to help you very much. And I'll tell you what it is. And if you know what a 3D composition is, then you don't need me to tell you what it is. But I'm going to try to give you some sense of what it is. And, you know, maybe you know, at least one person in the room would remember it for me. I remind them. Uh, so somehow, somewhere, the slide will be used. All right, so you have a graph and you want to represent it using a tree. Um, and what do I mean by represent? You have a graph G and you have a 3T, and then you have a function that assigns that assigns to every vertex of the tree uh, a bag of vertices of G. Right? So this, uh, for every, to every vertex of the tree, a subset of vertices of G. So the mental image you should have, it's a tree, and then there are little bags hanging on its uh, vertices, and in every bag, there's some vertices the graph you're trying to represent. And now there are three rules. Two rules tell you what it means to represent, what, what needs to be captured in the representation. And the third rule tells you that you can't just do it completely arbitrarily, there has to be some connection between uh, your tree and your graph. There it is. The first rule is every vertex needs to be in a bag. Right? If you forgot a vertex, that doesn't count. You didn't represent the graph. Second rule is every edge of the original graph, for every edge of the original graph, there needs to be a bag that contains both of them. And then the third rule is, and that's kind of what tells you that you can't just do whatever you like. Um, if you look at the vertex of the original graph and you see where in the tree it appears and what bags it appears, that has to be a connected graph. So you can't just uh, put one word, put the vertex on this leaf and on that leaf because you needed it there for some edges and, and go home. It's not a lot. If you put here and there, it has to be contained uh, in every in every bag along this path. All right, let's do some examples. Uh, so in these two examples, blue is the graph, and then uh, fuchsia is uh, uh, the tree that I'm going to use to represent it. And what I need to tell you is how to assign verses of the graph to verses of the tree. And for anybody who is colorblind, this is the blue side, mm -hmm. and this is a fuchsia screen. I'm a daughter and a mother of colorblind people. So. 
So, uh, so here the grafted and kind represented a tree, and the grafted and, and of course I'm going to represent it by tree, but I'm going to use the same tree for both. So now I'm going to tell you what the bags are, and uh, let me also tell you how I constructed this tree composition. So I chose a root for three, and then because it's a tree, every vertex has a unique path to the root, and it has a unique neighbor along its way to the root. Uh, and what I'm going to put in a bag for vertex V is V and its neighbor on its way to the root. So for example, for one, the path is one, two, three. So what's going to go in the bag for one is one and two. For four, the path is four, three. It's going to go in the bag for four is three and four. Three is already there, so it's a bag by three. Okay, so what we did was we constructed the tree composition for this tree, but of course you can tell that this is not even the constructed tree composition for any tree. And uh, the bag size is capped at two. Because the bag for the root has size one, and every other bag has size two. Size two. Okay, so that's uh, that's an interesting fact. Let's keep it in mind. Now here's another graph. This is not a tree. Uh, this is a tree composition for it. So let me tell you something about how I constructed it. So first I deleted one and I constructed a 3D composition for the remaining tree. And then I had to add one. So I know I need to add one to a bag that contains two and to a bag that contains six. So I will do it here and there. But then there is a rule. I can't just add one here and, I, and add one there. I need to put it uh, on the whole path. So that's why I had to add one. Everywhere. Okay. And uh, so you can check that this is a 3D composition for that. Um, and uh, so two things. One is here the bag size is two, here the bag size is three. That's not out of our laziness. It's a theorem that uh, you can only get to your composition with bag size two if what you started with doesn't have size. Second point is um, so it's unclear that we should be so proud of ourselves if we started with that the six lots and constructed a three composition where every bag has three lots. But you can convince yourself that you can do the same thing for any n vertex. In that sense, you you get a simplification. Right. All right. So this was this was some examples. Now let me summarize something. Uh, so first of all, I already started talking about the size of a bag. So we measure how complicated a tree composition is by how big a bag you need. The width of a tree composition is the maximum size of a bag minus one. Why minus one? Because you want trees to have two widths one. Okay, trees to have two widths two. This was a questionable decision on the part of people who. Uh, who uh, invented this definition because even though it makes it very elegant, it makes it very, very annoying when you try to think about it. You know, it's exactly minus one. Uh, so I suspect it's really not what it was. So then the second thing is so that, that was when you look at one tree composition and, and you know, uh, and you want to know how, um, how simple or complicated it is. Uh, now for, uh, for a graph tree, I want to define its tree width, and that's how complicated is its simplest tree composition? So it's a minimum of all tree compositions of the biggest bag in a tree composition. Minimum of all tree compositions of, of G of, of the width. And we say G has small tree widths. If it's to us, that's what we're going to mean by saying it's close to a tree. Or how this is justified by the fact trees have uh, tree widths one. Okay, so and just to repeat, here we got the tree composition of tree widths one. Here we got a tree composition of two, two, and you can't get a tree composition of two, one because uh, the graph is not good. Okay, so now why why tree compositions? Well, it's a nice way to describe the structure of a graph. And if you know something about the graph minor project from the 1990s, it's all about taking a minor free graph and representing and and, and finding nice tree compositions. But uh, more kind of um, um, less abstractly, more concretely, there are very clear connections between algorithms and 3D compositions. If you give me a 3D composition of bounded widths of a graph, then you can solve problems efficiently on that graph. So to say this uh, kind of more rigorously, for example, uh, you can solve uh, click, uh, click number, you can find click number in polynomial time on the class of graphs of two of most 100, of bounded two. You can, you can find coloring in polynomial time on the class of graphs of, uh, uh, of uh, bounded two. You can find stability numbers. Again, stable set means no edges in the set. 
stability number or maximum weight of a stable set uh, on graphs of bounded qubits. And to do that, uh, you use a tool called dynamic programming. I'm not going to explain now, but it's a very sort of it's a very general tool that does a lot of things for you. And one thing people are trying to understand now is uh, somehow bounded qubits is uh, is an over tool for this tool. You can ask for much less and still use this tool. There's a lot of work happening on trying to understand where that boundary is. But this is a topic for another talk. Uh, okay, so, uh, but what I want to talk about is when can you get bounded to it? So sometimes when I give this talk, I now stop for 10 minutes and explain how bounded to it is not the right thing to look at, and then I go back to this slide. It's always a bit awkward, but uh, I didn't do that. So, uh, so what I want to focus on in this talk is uh, try to understand which hereditary families, what you can see is hereditary, which we can also get into these subgraphs, uh, are uh, have bounded to it. And now I should say that this question, right, so the, there are many containment relations on graphs. And uh, if you ask for, for other containment relations, this question is uh, has been answered. The question is well understood. For example, if uh, the containment you're asking for is minors or then subgraphs, then there's a complete list, a single one graph. It tells you uh, that tells you if you forbid that the two is bounded, if you don't forbid that the two is not. Okay. So, but for reduced subgraphs, it's uh, hard. But first, let me tell you uh, kind of what we can learn from from this uh, more. Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure if it's more restrictive or less restrictive. Like it's a contain that contains relations are such that it's easier for a graph to be contained in another graph. So let's see what we can learn from that. So here are some graphs with big qubits. Uh, the complete graph has big qubits, has qubits uh, n minus one. Complete graph means all vertices are parallel adjacent. The complete backtrack graph, so that means you take two stable sets of both stable sets of size n and make everybody here adjacent to everybody there. That has qubits n, also has big qubits. Uh, now this is this kind of makes sense, right? It's a very dense graph, so that it stands to reason they're far from being two. But now here is a surprise. Uh, so this graph also has, has huge here. How huge? Uh, so you can sort of think of it as a like it has rows and columns, and you can think of it as having the same number of rows as a as, as number of columns. It's quite a big picture. Uh, so it's true, it's is its number of rows of columns. Uh, it could be a, a square root of a number of vertices. So okay, so this is called. The, the picture drawn here is called a wall, and then you're allowed to subdivide the edges, and then it's called a subdivided wall. Uh, and um, it's a cubic planar graph, but it has huge tables. Now, for minors, uh, this is it. If you, you have, if you don't contain this as a minor, that's a fixed T. If you don't contain a T by T wall as a minor, then your tubes is bounded as a function of T. And on the other hand, uh, this thing has a big it. So if you do contain it, you have big Um For subgraphs, uh, if, if you don't contain a subdivision of this as a subgraph, then you have one with it. But for reduced subgraph, it's more complicated. So here is uh, right away another graph that has large druids and it's independent uh, in terms of the new subgraph from that. So this is not contained in that, and that is not contained in this. Now, what is this? Well, um, so really the way to get this from that is to, to, it's called to take line graphs. But if you don't know what that means, you look at every vertex of degree three and you delete that vertex and you make its neighbor as a triangle. Uh, so it's very popular 25 years ago. It was called the delta y operations. No, nobody calls it that anymore. <laughs> but uh, I guess it's a y delta operation. Here it's a y and then here it's a delta. I, I just got the tail end of the delta y operations because it's a very complex thing that you know, only really experienced people understood. And then I grew up and I learned that that's all that means. So, um, okay, so, so this graph also has large periods. Uh, uh, so I'm just saying, again, well, this is so the triangles are triangles, but the, like all the other edges you're allowed to supplement. And this is kind of all the intuition we have from subgraphs or from minors. Don't, don't discover anything else in the field of papers, but it's the close. So one might hope 
and then this is a completely sort of statues from your second story. You have to, to, to explain this because it's different from your second and from minus, but you might hope that uh, this is enough. But uh, it turns out it's uh, very far from being enough. In, uh, uh, I didn't say one, but about 2019, uh, Cynthia and came up with an example uh, of a family of large trees. And it's actually much more restrictive than, than what you would get just, just by forbidding the grass in the previous slide. So it's a family of grass with no induced even cycle, no induced cycle on, on, on even number of vertices. And no click of size four. And they prove that in that family, for every K, we have a member of two with this K. So now let me just explain why this is related to that. Uh, so let's just remember they forbid K4 and cycles of even lengths. Here we have Kn, so okay, that's N plus four. Kn and all of C4 is K22. And, and we have to be in cycle. Uh, so you could be K to two. Now, this guy, I claim everybody that this contains an even cycle because take two far apart vertices, there are three paths between them that don't touch. Or two far apart vertices of the DC. In that picture, you uh, vary in a configuration like this. Now, in this configuration, two of these paths have the same parity, and then together they make an even cycle. Uh, this guy, it's the same thing except uh, to the white dots operation. Instead of uh, instead of two vertices, we take two triangles with, uh, with three paths between them, and then uh, and then uh, again two paths have the same parity. This is not uh, so. Okay, so they forbade much more than just this, right? And still they got. Uh, a family of large of, of large students. This is what that says. Uh, so that means there are other obstructions and we don't understand it. So then they continue to think, uh, you know, what, what might help? What can you say to uh, kind of go back to those obstructions we do understand? So one thing they notice is that in um, in their construction of graphs with large trivets, uh, they had to use large degrees. So to get big trivets, you need versus of big degrees. So then they said, well, maybe if I bound the degree, uh, then uh, um, uh, then these obstructions are sufficient. Or at least in this family, in the family with no large click and no even cycle, bounded degree guarantees bounded trivets. And that's the that question is yes. So they are not uh, a student that are and Christina McCloach and myself. And they conjectured. Uh, that actually, if you bound the degree, that the initial list of obstructions I showed you, if you forbid them, it guarantees bounded trivets. And that was proved uh, by uh, two back of one in 2022. So that's uh, fortunately, unfortunately, closed the bounded degree, degree case. Um, but uh, oh, I had to see if we can uh, tweak our methods to uh, tweak it to. Uh, Smaller word, we can start over and find that other methods so that uh, uh, so that we could do something in the unbounded degree case, and it turns out uh, that's what it is. Okay, so unbounded degree and bounded degrees. Let me first uh, give a name to the pictures for what I showed you. Uh, they're called T basic obstructions. So AT, ATT, subdivided wall with T rows and T columns, and it's a line graph. <clears throat> It's about T basic obstruction. And I know that I have to forbid the T basic obstruction. If I don't forbid them, there's no chance I'm going to get to with this. Thing. So then the question becomes um, what else do you need to forbid? So graph is T clean if it doesn't contain any T basic obstructions. And now I want to ask what do I need to forbid in the T clean graph in order to guarantee boundary truths? Okay, so uh, Lojin and Rasgun worked on a related question. Uh, so they proved the theorem not about T clean graphs. They asked, what finite families can I forbid? Oh, for, for what, what finite families can I forbid and do I need to forbid in order to get bounded to it? So notice this is different because when I when I think about uh, basic obstructions, these are by definition infinite families. I forbid all subdivisions of something. That's an infinite family. So they asked, how can I say this 
for the final family? What do I need to forbid for finitely many off to make sure that none of those infinitely many things appear? And it turns out it's not hard to see that you have to forbid KT, KTT, some graphs that looks like this, that's in order to get rid of the wall, and some graphs that, you know, so it says, you know, the line graph of that, and the bottom is going to place a wave and you go into that triangle. Um, and that's to get rid of the line graph. And it turns out that you can, uh, well, that's not, right? So it's easy to see that uh, if you're going to forbid something finite, and that would imply that all the TBS constructions are forbidden, it has to be that. That's not the interesting part of this. But you know, the interesting part of the theorem is that that's enough. That thing that you have to forbid is actually enough. And uh, let's see, let me tell you something about that one. Uh, so, uh, so now I'm kind of I'm starting in a different place with the describing the truth part, and I'm going to come back to the actual story about that. So a K block in a graph is K vertices, so that every two of them are K connected. K connected means that K vertices show the path between them. Now you can, uh, you can and you should ask uh, the path between these two vertices allowed to go through those, you know, to that vertices in the block, things like that. All of that doesn't matter. You can kind of imagine everything being completely disjoint from each other because you go from K to half K and you solve this problem. So what you should think about is, Vertices in some part of the K pass here and this K pass here, this K pass there, and this K pass everywhere. And this bunch of paths is allowed to meet that one. But uh, but within, within the bunch, they're all about this. So that's K block. And K block consists of K bananas. That's what you get between two bases. <laughs> okay. So, so then there's a theorem of Weissauer. That tells you that if you don't have a K block, then you have a very nice 3D composition. And what very nice means is with another look at the code. So your 3D compositions look like this. Let's go here is how I look in the world. Here's how I draw a 3D composition. So this uh, these are bags of the 3D composition. You kind of uh, See the tree underneath it, but what I'm drawing are the bags of each one. So the bags are allowed to intersect and so on. And uh, <clears throat> so now, what's a, so for every bag, there's something called its torso. And what that means is you remember the bag, but also you remember how to, it talks to the rest of the gun. What do I mean by that? You look at this bag, you look at places where it meets other bags, and you make you make this appear. So every place where it's Meets another bed that's called an, an, an adhesion. Uh, you uh, you make that into, and there's a sense in which it remembers this with the graph. What? So now um, the reason this is okay. So in what sense does it remember the rest of the graph? Well, well, if I now put some other three D composition of this and some other three D composition of the torso of that, and so on and so forth, I can then do them together. The reason I can do them together is because the way three compositions work, for every click, there is a bed that contains. So then, if I have a three composition of this, and some bed contains this click, and I have a three composition of this, and some bed contains that click, I can put them together. I'll take the tree for this, and I'll take the tree for that, and uh, this is the vertex in this tree that contains that click, and this is the vertex in this tree, this is the vertex in this tree that contains that click. And then, if I put an edge here, that's going to be a tree composition of me. So if you can get a tree composition for each torso, it's easy to construct a tree composition for all. So now what Weiser proved is that if graph does if a graph doesn't have a K plus one block, then there's a tree composition of small adhesion that we get for now. Uh, so that every torso has at most uh, K vertices of degree uh, at least some. So if you don't have a K block, K block implies three composition that that every torso has new high degree vertices. The few words are few and high degree power. Okay, so now remember they're forbidding some exceptions. Here's a three composition that twice out of you. Uh, you can check, it's not hard to check that. If the graph didn't contain the abstractions that uh, 
then contain uh, those instructions, then uh, the torsos don't contain them either. You need to uh, change the parameters a little bit, but that's true. So now each torso doesn't contain the abstractions and only has few high degree verses. If you don't contain the logic that's going to abstractions, you don't contain our T basic abstractions. So by Korhorn's theorem, if your degree is bounded, then the duet is bounded. So what did we prove? We proved that in every torso, I can delete a few words of high degree and then get something with small duet. So that's wonderful. Now we put it all together, take a torso, delete a few words of high degree, get a whole duet decomposition. Now put this few words of high degree in every bag. You're allowed to do that, only a few of them. And now, but what I just explained, you can glue together the three decomposition of the torsos. Oh, so what does it tell us? All of this says that if only there, there were no K blocks, then everything would work. If only there were no K blocks, then even excluding the basic abstractions, the K blocks would bound into it. So now the game of understanding, of understanding this question becomes a game of understanding K blocks. And the proof of uh, Lotion and Escon becomes the game of understanding K blocks. And now I'm not going to explain it, but uh, you can use round material to analyze what cables look like. It turns out every cable contains, uh, contains uh, one of their sections. Either this. Okay, so we saw Lotion and Escon theorem, and we said, well, we're going to do all the same, but we're going to fight much harder with rounds of theorem. And uh, so I, I don't think they present that book quite like this, but this is really good. Um, so, uh, so we thought we would fight much harder, and we did. And we proved this uh, colorful, colorful theorem. So let me explain to you something about it. Uh, so instead of forbidding the finite family of origin, as going to forbidding T basic obstructions, and then we can prove that if you forbid this and this and that, then the two is bounded. So these are some infinite families of graphs, which is what was described here. Let me just say one word about it. So the way this picture is color coded, blue things you decide. You can decide how long this path is. You can decide the degree of this vertex. You know, same deal here. You can decide how long this is and so on. Purple things, future things, and these triangles, they're triangles. You can't do anything with them. They have to be triangles. But then, you know, these uh, things uh, highlighted in yellow, those things, and there, uh, that's where the infinite bit comes in. There you have to, to, to allow them in all lengths. So you decide on some bits of the graph, and then you have a few edges, and you have to allow, so in, in the thing you forbid, you have to uh, include all possible lengths of those edges, all possible subdivisions of those edges. So obviously, it doesn't matter very much if some three families of these matrix. And uh, all fine. Three infinite families of fine. Now, why do we care? This is a very strange term. Um, we care because if we get to the punchline, you can get a kind of an if not like you can get an if and only if theory, you can get a dichotomy. So if I ask which one graph can I exclude so that a T clean graph has one of the curious, then you have an answer. It has to be. A graph that looks like this, a graph where every component is uh, the subdivided uh, subdivided star. And by this very complicated theorem, it's enough. It's every H of R infinite family is contains them. So well, you get this uh, dichotomy for excluding one graph. We're working on trying to get the dichotomy for excluding finitely many graphs. Uh, but they're not there yet. Uh, now, the reason we know that these are so the, the if is that strange theorem I showed you. The, for the only if part, we needed other obstructions, right? We're not going to get this from, I mean, we already excluded tickly. We were already excluding the t-basic obstructions. So we're not going to get any more only if facts. But uh, in the meantime, people have been working hard and they came up with a bunch of other families uh, of uh, unbounded periods. Uh, so I'll not explain all that, but I'll show you a picture. This is called the death star. <laughs> yes, I see from the giggles that some people here get the cultural reference, so I'll give you a hint and to, um, to, to reflect it like this. Um, I, I didn't know. Okay, that, that one has no cultural significance. <laughs> 
Okay. So that was that was one thing, and then uh, we tried to hunt around for other families uh, where we can say something. You know, for other families where we can say something about uh, the Jews uh, when the T basic abstractions are excluded. So one, so from from this picture, and you can generalize this top picture. The red guys can have so the vertical start can have. Uh, uh, actually, lots of neighbors on each horizontal path. It doesn't have to be just one name. As long as their neighbors are kind of, uh, uh, they don't uh, interleave, each one gets a separate interval. But that's going to be another new example. Uh, that's a more general pictures. Bits, which gives me an idea why I didn't put it on the slide. So, and what this is, if you if you look at this picture, you keep having cycles and vertices with lots of neighbors in this. And so here, like he has really lots of neighbors in this cycle, but in what I drew there, the middle guy has two neighbors and a whole bunch of cycles. So we thought, well, you know, how can we kind of exclude? And then you can see that it's the same thing here. So we're thinking, like, how can I concisely exclude all of that? And we said, for be versus these two neighbors in the same. And it turns out that's enough, that they scale. So we later discovered this other people had again and we want you to think about these families. Uh, so a whole a cycle in the works with these two neighbors, and it is called the propeller. 2012, uh, somebody tried to describe the structure of, uh, uh, of propeller free graphs, graphs that don't contain propellers. And we were very sad to find out that we could not use any of the results. So, how we have to reprove them all in a slightly different setting. So, they prove every propeller free graph admits a certain decomposition. We had to prove if you see this subgraph in a propeller free graph, then you have a decomposition that breaks this little subgraph. And that's how they proved their theories, but they never, you know, they didn't care about that. So they didn't keep, keep track of that. So we had to redo many of their proofs in, in different ways, uh, but we did it. And so with this group of people, so my student, Tara Bishami, Bogdan Aleko, Sefer Hajibi, Sofish Proko, and Christina Vuskovic, uh, we were able to prove that uh, if a graph doesn't have a propeller and then you have a T-basic abstraction, then has bound to it and not tell them strongly. Uh, so I mean, maybe take my last five minutes. Thank you. Uh, so now remember it all started with uh, with even whole free graphs. Uh, right? Uh, St. Jerry and Jordan you know, came up with a family of graphs with no even cycles that uh, had arbitrary large truths. And then they tried to find ways to remedy that. They said maybe to bound the degree that would work. You know, then we will get down the tubes. But they made two other conjectures by inspecting their construction. They said maybe if you don't contain diamond and you bound the cliff number, the tubes is bounded, and diamond is this good. And then they made another conjecture uh, that again is consistent with their examples. Um that uh, the tubes is not the tubes of the whole photographs is not nickel size t. It's not bounded, but it's logarithmic in the number of verses. Which, for remember, I told you that uh, uh, there is um, um, uh, somehow one interest in three compositions to run algorithms. And for most of the algorithms we know about and we care about, uh, this is just as good. You don't need bounded to it, or we can do it is enough. Because all you need is to be able to look at all subsets of the bag in polynomial time. If the bag has the logarithmic in many verses, you can do that. Uh, so, and uh, we so far have been able to prove that conjecture one is true. Working on conjecture two, we thought we had a little cut and close a couple months ago and kind of fell out. I used to have this slide with a different, uh, with a different uh, function. So, is I, true? Function? I, true? I don't know. <laughs> true and false three times every day. So, I <laughs> uh, okay, and I'm going to stop here. Thank you.
there any questions? Oh, could you show slide number three? <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, G is perfect if and only if. Uh, so, the first condition is the uh, cyclic graph of all lengths is not the subgraph of G. What, what is the other condition? Uh, this is the complement of an old cycle. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what, what about the graph uh, of the uh, complete graph on three vertices? Right. So, that one is perfect because. Yes. Uh, it's true that the click the chromatic number is three, yeah. but on the other hand, the click number is not two. That the way I show that an odd cycle is not perfect, I said the click number is two and the chromatic number is three. But here the chromatic number is three, but the click number is also three. Yeah. Um, but for this the, one, the, the chromatic yeah. number is three. But the cycle graph C3 is so th this is meant to be a boss in the next generation. Oh, okay, it's going to be equal to two. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so uh, following up on the last question, so both problems of determining the chromatic number and the click number, they both are in the heart. And yet you are saying that uh, determining whether they are equal is problem of time. Yes. It is. But, <laughs> not just equal, but not just equal for the graph, equal for the graph and all of the subject. That's where, that's why it's perfect and not just uh, okay. who, who proved it? Who proved it? That uh, the, the equality can be determined in the uh, So it's uh, Paul Seymour, me, uh, Christina Wuskovic, Gerard Conjols, mm -hmm. and another person whom I never met and this is that. Is, uh, his last name is you. What year? You know? Uh, yes, I find uh, 2003. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was published in subsequent year. Thank you. Um, so I have a couple, but it's a long each one takes. Um, can you say something about graphs with a specific tree width, like tree width three? Can you classify the graphs that have? No, that's so small tree, it's very small tree, it's again. Uh, do it, uh, so I don't know, I don't know, it's do it to your bag size. There's something called um, um, series parallelographs, and they have uh, bags of size three, so do it's two. So do it's one is three, do it's two is uh, small parallelographs. Uh, but then it gets complicated, like many, like chromatic numbers, easy, and it's not easy. Like, um, so, one more question is, is there an algorithm for finding the tree width for particular families of graphs, like portal graphs? Uh, so, portal graphs, yes, because the click number is the tree width. Uh, and I mean, for many families, yes, but in general, it's not complete. But what mm -hmm. is true and useful is that if I tell you a graph has two widths 100, then you can find actually linear time of tree composition of widths 100. So, for all the algorithmic questions, it's enough to prove that everybody in a certain family has gone to do it, and then you don't need to worry about right. whether you yes. can actually get the punch. That's even true for logarithmic trees. And is this tree with stuff, has it made it into a book yet or a book chapter? Is it all just pages? Uh, so it, it certainly did. Uh, there's a paper, there's a book by, oh, I don't remember one. Of, I can do two of this. There's a book, some of which authors are. Sigan and really true, but it has other authors to say. I talked to, uh, and they have a very nice book on Um There's a bunch of uh, sort of the basics of triplets in Distel's book on graph theory, and her Distel has a lovely book mm -hmm. called Graph Theory, which is likely you need to know how graph theory works and that one stuff. And yeah, so it's definitely it's a couple of chapters there. Are there more questions? At some point, I thought you said you mentioned boundary tree, but then you said I'm not going to care about this later on. Could you say that? Um, 
I hope not. <laughs> I thought, I thought, I thought <laughs> earlier on this slide, I said I'm, I'm, I'm discussing down tree with you, but uh, I don't really. I think I'm not going to care about this uh, later on or something like that. Yeah, so, possibly here I said, but for the dynamic programming to work, you need much less than boundary fluids. Okay, no, but no. I'm not gonna talk about that now. All right, mm -hmm. okay. Should come back in a second. Oh, I know what I said. I said I usually spend a lot more time on this on this slide, <laughs> and by the time I'm done. I convinced everybody that yeah, bound materials is not the right concept. Okay, and then I right. move on to this, which is some of the slide. Yes. The, is the minimal tree with um, the decomposition, is that unique to a graph? No. no. Does that cause problems when doing the proofs, or is that like not really a big deal? It is not. It's not. I mean, and I'm sure it could cause problems. Yeah. So far, yeah, to me, it is. There are some sort of more canonical, like uh, more canonical is not maybe to say, it, but uh, there are some tree decomposition with nice properties, and sometimes it's needed to focus on those. But even this, I don't think are canonical, which is more restricted. If you have a few minutes, would you come back to the adhesion? And you said the small, small adhesion, and I've never heard of that before. So an adhesion just means if you look at uh, you look at the two decomposition, you look at two neighboring banks, you look at their intersection. That's called an adhesion. So every set like that is an adhesion. Sure. And then the you know, adhesion at most k means all of those have sided most k. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let's send this to the other.